Good morning and welcome to the Souter Theatre of Culture Perth and Kinross and the launch of an historic map of Perth. <clears throat> Published today jointly by the Historic Towns <coughs> Trust and PSNS. I'm John Lewington, who was volunteered to cha chair this event today <laughs> by my colleagues. Why? I've got a foot in two of the camps involved in the creation of this map. <clears throat> I am a member of Perthshire Society of Natural Science, no less a former president, but I'm delighted to see other former presidents <laughs> around me. But for by that, I'm a fellow of the Royal Scottish Geographical Society, and if you think I could weasel out of being involved, you're wrong. So I've been involved from the beginning. <clears throat> Later you're going to hear from the Chair of the Trustees of the Historic Towns Trust, about which you know possibly not very much at the moment. You're going to hear from the President of PSNS archaeological and historical section. If somebody could come up with something easier to say, I'd be grateful. She's going to tell you how it happened. The Chief Executive of the Royal Scottish Geographical Society is going to give you a sense of place, which seems reasonable, and Perth's leading historian is going to tell you what goes on in Perth, not where we all are, but below our feet, where he spent the last several years <laughs> digging and delving and finding the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the buried truth. <clears throat> and finally, we'll hear from the Honorary Secretary of the Historic Towns Trust. As far as I know, he hasn't been given very long to speak. I'm supposed to keep them to a vague timetable. So, wish me well. Can I start by taking you back to the 18th century? Seems reasonable. A period in our history known as the Scottish Enlightenment. It was a time characterised by an outpouring of intellectual and scientific accomplishments fostered by Scotland's network of parish schools and Scotland's five universities. At that time, England had just <clears throat> the field that they were involved with rapidly expand, expanded from archaeology, I think that's alphabetically the first, to zoology, which I think is alphabetically the last. Among the great thinkers that this period threw up, you'll know many of them and be able to quote them at length. Robert Burns, Adam Ferguson, David Hume, James Hutton, John Playfair and Adam Smith. You'll agree, not a bad bunch. The reason for this flowering you could trace back to the period immediately after 1707, when you will recall the two countries merged. <clears throat> Politicians, parliamentarians and such like folk left Scotland for their new home south of the border, leaving Scotland in the hands of people like lawyers, the divines, professors, medical men, and all sorts of other smart Alex. <laughs> and they were, sorry, I'm, I missed architects. <laughs> if I cause offence, I apologise. They were the group of people who got together and created this wonderful period, the Scottish Enlightenment. And here's the extraordinarily good news. You are here today because the Enlightenment continues. Well done. <laughs> anyway, thus to Perth and 1785, before my time, but the Literary and Antiquary Society of Perth was established to consider philosophy, the belle lettres, fine arts as well as antiquities, plus anything else that took their interest. But 
1867, presumably to better represent the interests of some of its members, Perthshire Society of Natural Science split from the earlier body. PSNS's aims were and remain to encourage, foster and further interest in a wide range of natural science subjects. Lectures were organised seemingly starting at 8.15pm when two members would read a paper and those there present would then discuss. It's a hard life being a PSNS member in the past. <laughs> I would love to have been present at some of those talks. In 1884, evolution and some things regarding it. In 1887, notes on the native races of Perthshire. In 1909, fingerprints and other modes of identification. In 1905, a paper was presented entitled The Voyage of Scotia. That was the expedition supported by RSGS to the Antarctic and some of the relics from that are available to view in the Fairmaid's house today. They collect, the members collected flora, fauna, birds, insects, perhaps not the sort of things we do today, but that's what the members did. They store them because they wanted to, share them with other people, and so they needed somewhere to put them. And a museum and library was created in 1883 in South St. David Street, which later expanded. In 1903, PSNS gifted its buildings and its museum to Perth Town Council, who've administered it ever since, and were grateful to their successors, Culture, Perth and Kinross, for looking after us today so well. The collection moved again in 1935 to the building in George Street, and of course, on April the 1st, 2024, the museum moved again to the new museum, bang in the centre of the city. <clears throat> Long before the computer and the internet, a library was an essential tool for scientific study. And from its founding in 1867, the Society accumulated a vast collection of books and journals. Today, the library reigns in the possession of the Society and it's housed in Perth Art Gallery. And this is indeed it. It is perhaps the most complete Victorian natural history library outside of a university or a national library. We have around two and a half thousand books, most published in the 19th century. The Society's talks have continued since the beginning, so that now every winter the Society produces a series of talks under the heading Curious Minds. To give you a flavour of what goes on, still very much part of the Scottish Enlightenment, this winter we've heard about blue carbon, the secret life of galaxies, next generation batteries, inside the world of killer fungi, the impact of noise on marine wildlife, the social behaviour of fish. Who's got the maintenance man manual for planet Earth? <laughs> the ethics of medical trials, language and identity, the intersection of science and theology, and last but by no means least, the St Andrews University Photographic Collection, one of the oldest and most comprehensive in the country. And just to add further variety, in 2022, the, His the Society was approached by the Historic Towns Trust to help create the map which we launched today. A group of interested folk from as many local groups as could be contacted of around 20 was invited to hear from the HTT cartographer who explained what was required and thus work began. Many of you will know how much of a challenge working in a committee 
especially of so many, is. But cooperation flourished, and the result you will have bought or be able to buy later today. And shortly you'll hear how this task was achieved. Now I have to introduce our first speaker. Vanessa Harding is Professor Emeritus of London History from Birkbeck College at the University of London. She's Chair of the Trustees of the Historic Towns Trust and it would be remiss of me not to mention that she started her university education in one of our neighbours not far away. That's St Andrews. So we regard her as a local. <laughs> Vanessa. Thank you very much for that welcome John and thank you for mentioning one of the many reasons that I'm really really pleased to be here today. Um, St Andrews is my alma mater and it's where I began to be interested in history, or not began to be interested, where I developed my interest in history and where I began a PhD thesis on medieval London, which was one of the things that set me going as an urban historian for the whole of my career. Uh, it's not my brief today to thank everybody for participating and contributing to the map, but I do want to thank those of you who come today for your interest, your attention uh, and for your engagement with this project. So what I want to do is to say just a bit about the Historic Towns Trust, uh, what we do uh, and why we do it and where we hope we're going. That's kind of great. So we're a charity um, and our aims, our mission is to support and promote research into the history and topography of cities and towns in Great Britain. And the aim of this is to help people to understand the richness of our shared urban heritage. And our approach to this mission, the way we seek to fulfil it, is by creating and publishing high quality historical maps and atlases of Britain's towns and cities. And all of these maps and atlases are produced in collaboration with local experts, societies and funders. I was particularly struck by what John was saying about the long history of interest in the past, in understanding, in knowledge, uh, in enlightenment uh, and 19th century Perth, and indeed in 20th and 21st century Perth. So everything that we do has to be collaborative, um, constructive. Uh, we hope that it enhances, that it multiplies, that it brings together uh, interests and ends up with this uh, interesting, appealing uh, and attractive um, output. Our coverage uh, so far, we've done 24 British cities or towns, and Perth is the 17th place to be covered in our Town and City Historical Map series. There are two more maps due this year. Uh, there's an atlas underway. The maps due this year are Bath and Ripon. Uh, the atlas is Canterbury, which will be another couple of years. And there are other projects underway. We have a remit as a national organisation, the British Historic Towns Atlas, now the British Historic Towns Trust, um, and our aim is to fulfil that, and so we're particularly pleased to be publishing the first sheet map north of the border. Uh, and maps of Glasgow were included in our first four-city atlas, published back in the 1960s, but I think that our future is going to be publishing maps and then when and where possible, building on, single, building on them to produce single volume atlases going forward. I'll say a bit more about comparison or compar comparability in a moment, um, but it's also worth noting that we're part of a much larger project, uh, the European Historic Towns Atlas Series. This was a group, or this is, arises from uh, discussions and collaborations formed in the aftermath of World War II, when so much of Europe's urban fabric had been damaged or destroyed, or indeed was on the point of being lost to redevelopment. And the aim was to map the historic fabric of towns and cities across Europe to help preserve them where possible, or at least to record, and again to enhance people's understanding of the urban path, past. 
Uh, coverage varies from uh, country to country, as you can see. Um, enormous amount has been going on, in, particularly in Germany. Uh, one of our close competitors is the Irish Historic Towns Atlas, with whom we often work, uh, and that they have achieved so far a much wider coverage than we have. And the differences from, town to, from country to country um, often depend on local factors and particularly um, on funding and how the, as the, the, the Historic Towns Atlas organisation has been set up. In our case, as I say, we're a charity, we're dependent on funds that we can raise. We don't have an official um, backer like, the, for example, the Irish Historic Towns Atlas does. But working with colleagues uh, in Ireland and across Europe in the International Commission for the History of Towns is a very important and fruitful aspect of what we do. And that really is what one of the things that we're on about. Because one of the things we're really keen on is comparability. So uh, a founding feature of the European Historic Towns Atlas project was that we would all produce maps and atlases at 1 to 2,500. That is about 25 inches to the mile. This means that you can, although local conventions, local practices uh, will vary, is that you can actually set maps of uh, cities or towns from across Europe against one another and look at them and seek to understand how the different places have evolved. Uh, and we find that um, that comparability that uh, is a real is a really important feature of what we do. And even within Britain, we're now getting to the stage where we have a critical mass, I think, of towns mapped in such a way that we can look at them and think about how they have evolved, uh, what factors have shaped them, and that these towns vary from uh, cathedral cities, they're perhaps the obvious one, but industrial and post-industrial towns. So, for example, we've mapped Swansea and Hull and Coventry, university towns, so far only Oxford and Cambridge, but maybe we'll get onto one of the Scottish uh, university towns before too long. And of course, more than fortified boroughs, uh, such, as, uh, such as Perth, but also Annick. Uh, you may have been able to see some, some of the other maps that we've produced, that we've set out uh, on the store next door. Uh, some of you indeed have been buying them, which is, which is wonderful. So I just want to thank you now for your support, your interest, your enthusiasm. Um, we're celebrating the completion of one map project uh, with this launch, but I want to say that this is not the uh, this is not the end. We hope that we can continue to work together with people in Perth, maybe to create an atlas that will uh, uh, Perth is certainly a worthy city for this, and an atlas would be able to pick up and display much more of the rich and complex history of Perth that we all begin to know about. And we're also very keen to find ways in which the map we have produced could be used to further educational uh, and other um, interests uh, across the future. So thank you very much for your attention. Say this has been a, an amazing couple of years, a great journey, even though it's all just been done within a square mile. Uh, square mile physically and but a thousand years of history. And we've crammed it all onto one sheet of paper, so it, it is quite a feat. I'm having to uh, realise and admit that today. And we've really appreciated the, uh, the objective and the perspective provided by Historic Towns Trust to make it possible. My I've got, to do, I've got to do a slide, haven't next I? Slide, next slide, yeah. Here we go, right, we can start um, Some of you might think there's a slight borrowing of a certain author, Scottish author here. And, uh, but I thought somebody in the HET actually did, thought of it, but I've stolen it for the day. We're creating a fair map of Perth. So the nod is to Walter Scott, but we don't mention him actually in the map. He's recognised down in the town of Perth, but, so, but while he's uh, recognised in stone there, uh, he's not made it on the paper here. I think he has enough publicity um, himself. But we found our own uh, Perth-born Scottish uh, bard, and more of him later. So as Vanessa was saying, 
why a partnership? It's a very clever system um, that's being developed. They have the technology and enthusiasm for maps and history, and they tap into the local knowledge for maps and history uh, in every town they approach. Neither could do it on their own, so it is a very good combination. Uh, the Perthshire Society of Natural Science has in its membership, as John has uh, hinted, people of knowledge and expertise with strong links across the town to all the different organisations. And so those are what we've, who we've pulled together. But to make it happen, we had to seek support. And some of our funders are here today, and they are, will, uh, will be acknowledged later. But here are just a list of some of the uh, supporters. And those are just ones got early in the, in the uh, exercise. They have increased as people have got to hear about us. Once we knew that we had uh, sufficient funds in place, we pressed our fingers to the start line, if you like, uh, January 23, when Charles Darks, the Historic Times Trust cartographer, and John Moore, who's here today, the secretary, came to Perth to give us practical advice on the, uh, how to do things. So this was our uh, January last year was our start gun firing, if you like. We formed groups to make uh, various um, elements take, take, take each element forward. A management group to do the um, executive decisions. A working group. Could you all put your hands up? Working group. Scattered around the room, they're wearing badges. A lot of them could be here today. So if you want to ask further questions afterwards, find somebody with a badge. We broke... Um, we chose topography, religion, commerce, and culture to divide the information of the town up so that we could go away and uh, within subgroups, um, we could explore these different subject areas. Naturally, they all overlap, but that was the way we found to make it uh, work so we could get something down on paper. We planned. I didn't draw this map, this was done by John Jessup, but it's a Gantt chart, so we did a Gantt chart. And amazingly, we actually have um, managed to keep pretty much to it. But I don't need to give you details, we're here today. Um, we decided, from the very start, we used the opening of the new museum as our co uh, completion target. We felt that this map was such an obvious complement to the city's new museum that this would give us the incentive to concentrate our efforts. A deadline that would de deter us from exploring down the myriad um, <clears throat> rabbit holes that history research always presents, and which would, could have meant us taking years and years. I'm sure you'll appreciate that. And of course, we didn't want to steal the limelight of the museum opening, that wouldn't be fair. So we gave the museum a few weeks to settle in. I'm sure it was mentioned at the museum opening, and of course you'll all know this, being interested in the history. Uh, but I enjoy the fact that we are launching this map, which naturally um, acknowledges uh, Perth's critical relationship with Schoon and Schoon Abbey. We launched 600 years to the month, May 1424, when James I of Scotland was crowned on a piece of stone, now celebrated down the road in the beautiful new museum. So yes, the definitive site list listing. At the start, we asked everyone to choose um, to kick us off. There's 10 things about Perth they thought most important and that should be included in the story. Obviously, this grew exponentially. We stopped at around 270, um, but we could have gone on indeed. So after the Gantt chart, of course, a spreadsheet was, Excel spreadsheet was created. And in, um, in making our final decision of the items going in, I must give a couple of personal thanks, but uh, David Perry has been our resident accuracy checker. Thankfully, he volunteered right at the start to get involved. And he has been our constant throughout. As an archeologist, his knowledge is naturally deep. He knows, along with some of other people in the room, uh, things that lie deep beneath Marks and Spencer's at the High Street. <laughs> and I think Perth Archives upstairs in this library is possibly his second home. They certainly know him well there. 
But uh, right to her sending off final copy, David continued to worry at detail, and we are most grateful for the huge amount of work he did put in. His tiny writing you, you would have seen along in the exhibition room on some, around some of the maps. So we got from our uh, different groups to uh, populate the map. The map was created by Charles Darks, um, based on the Ordnance Survey uh, 1901 map. And this provides uh, sufficient modern information for the, the current day reader to understand it. And on that, we had to place our historical choices. We thank Trail Architects of Carpenter Street, who very kindly uh, printed off many copies of the sheets that we needed to um, scribble on and draw. It was, um, it was sort of good fun, but it was sort of expensive, and we're much appreciating their input. Because uh, all the coloured dots and lines that we were drawing in with our subgroup had to be collated onto that map. So it was sort of like um, playgroup for very grown-up adults, which was rather nice. But Giles uh, required accuracy in defining all the plots. And uh, so it came to drawing the specific places that we chose on the map. And this is where um, it gets quite difficult, because you're referring to old uh, drawn maps from other centuries, and it's not too easy to line them up. So our cartographer, sorry, there we go. We have to thank uh, John, whose blushes I can save today because he is supping, hopefully, nice, lovely coffee and croissant in France, uh, having a, a holiday that did happen to clash with this, this date we picked. Uh, he did send us good luck. Um, we didn't need luck, but he did send us good wishes yesterday. But he was, was the person who was the conduit between HTT and ourselves. They asked that we had one person to communicate with, otherwise it could just become a mess. And I gather they, uh, that, would, uh, that was arrived at through much experience of uh, dealing with enthusiastic community groups. So John was our uh, conduit all the way through, but he also had these amazing skills with um, certain <coughs> software to do with maps. And so he had to stay on it very much. He is a retired architect, so he could see the vision and see where we were going, and he had this map software and the skill to manipulate it. And not only did he host multiple meetings at his home, uh, he made excellent coffee, strong enough to keep us wide awake and paying attention. And uh, so we had to explain, obviously, the physical map and putting it on the paper. History is ever, ever a trajectory, and as soon as we started, we realized how transient things, in fact, are. We looked at our favorite things. We saw afresh how quickly things come and go. Huge, famous whiskey bonds and world headquarters of insur for insurance come and go in a lifetime. So we battled with ourselves as to what comes and what goes in and what stays. And with regards to the explanation as to how Perth is where it, it, where it is, we mentioned, as we have already, our strong connections with the Royal Scottish Geographical Society, whose headquarters are in Perth. The retired head of geography of Perth Academy, an enthusiastic polymath himself, like his hero, Patrick Geddes, Kenny MacLean was our uh, in-house, if you like, contact author of numerous educational books on geography. He sadly did not make it with us to our finish line. Kenny McLean died just barely two, two months ago, busy discussing the map and finishing the drawings that uh, explain important water features in Perth on the screen here. His contribution is written and drawn throughout the map and gathered here. And we're very sad, but we're pleased that we uh, dedicated this production to Kenny McLean. And so while the physical map is being uh, put together, we turn to the, the rear of the map, the gazetteer. The collected written data that we chose tells a good story of Perth. As I mentioned, we used the topography, religion, commerce and culture. And this provided our framework for telling Perth's story. 
it's got a, so a thousand, we've yes, managed to get a thousand years of history into this sheet. This is just an early draft. What you've purchased or are going to purchase um, is a different arrangement, more attractively um, arranged. And this is the skill that between us and, but very much Charles Darks, to create a, a product that is attractive to read. And of course, there's always the element of anybody under a certain age looks at a map and wonders why it isn't all online, but actually we are delighted with the response we have to the paper map. A lot of young people do still like paper maps. So we had a team of experts validating our map as we went through the map and the written work. And we're extremely grateful for their um, time and input that they, these professionals put into our work. And we are quite proud, and maybe it's a, a nod to David uh, Perry's enthusiasm and uh, attention that they didn't use too much red ink when they sent, their, sent, us, sent, their, sent the drafts back. But without their comment, we could not move forward with confidence. And here's Charles, who couldn't make it to, he had, did come up twice to uh, see us and help us. Uh, and in one of the uh, newsletter articles I wrote a while back, I described Historic Towns Trust as a classic car sweeping into Perth and offering a clear road map for the journey we were going to be undertaking in this map. Charles smoothed out potholes and speed bumps, and his well-oiled wheels smooth and smooth gear changing swept us to towards completion. He's always polite, uh, patient, and very considered, and of course his cartographic skills are amazing. You'll see those for yourself. I think we did actually almost cause him to break sweat this year, though, um, in our enthusiasm to match our desired um, completion date. We are very aware we put a lot of pressure on him, but we are extremely glad that he did it. It hugely makes um, sense in Perth. As I would just like to mention, um, at the start I made my nod to Walter Scott, but the, the map, we acknowledge Henry Adamson, Perth's homegrown but not so well known bard. Henry Adamson was born in 1581, son of a Perth provost uh, and dean of the Guildry, I think, or merchant of Guildries. Um, and, but he became a teacher in Perth, and he wrote an epic news on the glory that he saw of, uh, that was Perth in previous centuries, and also lamented the loss of his dear friend, uh, Master Gull. But last summer, we were delighted to um, be introduced to Emeritus Professor David Parkinson from Saskatchewan University, Canada. He happened to be over um, Wrecking his visiting Scotland, uh, visiting scholarship to study Adamson's Muses Threnody. So he was going to, is doing or has done a new edition of the Muses Threnody for the Scottish Tech Society. And it was a beautiful meeting of minds and interest in the city. Um, David overflows with knowledge and enthusiasm for Perth, but it was rather good to have a Saskatchewan professor over here. Um, joining us with our project, and he was very generous with his knowledge. And um, he was linked to uh, another project which is happening in Perth at the time, Walking Perth's, uh, at this time, Walking Perth's Past. Uh, there are a group of colleagues from St Andrews University, do you want to wave? There's a nice group of people, led by Bess Rhodes and, uh, yes, who are over this weekend, um, creating walks based around the Muses Threnody, which talks of much of Perth's story, but takes you on walks, literally, so you walk along with the Nade and the uh, medieval things. Uh, so I think this is a rather lovely um, meeting of great minds thinking alike. Our HDT and us coming together to create this map, and there's um, David in Canada beavering away at the idea, and there are young, people, young students today taking Perth forward so that young generations um, can be inspired. 
So we did, didn't do a pass past. We used stepping stones backwards to make a, sweet, a stepping stone forward for our young and for visitors to Perth. So I borrow this quote from Henry Adamson's fourth news, describing efforts of pearl fishers on the Tay, um, with a little um, borrow, as I say, that we hope we have found enough pearls to give greater understanding of Perth to inspire for further exploration of this with our fair map of Perth. John and Teresa, um, congratulations on getting the map produced so quickly. Um, it's a fantastic achievement, and uh, on behalf of the society, we were certainly um, incredibly enthusiastic to see this um, come to fruition. Um, it is no mean feat, uh, so congratulations, wonderful, and, and, and everybody should buy one. Um, I am a, a poor substitute uh, today um, for. Uh, Kenny McLean, who will be known to many of you here, and is a very good friend to me and the society. This is uh, Kenny receiving the Tidy Education Medal, which is our highest accolade for teachers. Um, a great story just to tell very quickly is um, I was giving blood in Perth and uh, happened to sit for my uh, cup of tea and a biscuit at a table with this couple from Dumfries, and immediately they heard I worked in geography, started telling me this wonderful teacher that they knew and what an inspiration he'd been both to students and teachers and uh, Kenny certainly was that. So uh, I'm delighted to say he's a much uh, more intelligent man than me and he's uh, contributed to this map. Uh, what I've tried to do here is just give a little bit more of a sense of place uh, and I'll try and explain uh, what, <coughs> I, um, what I mean by that. So first of all, I don't really, I guess the premise in all of this is that I don't really think Perth has a very good sense of itself. Um, I actually chaired the Perth City Leadership Forum and we tried to interview people to say, what does Perth mean to you? And it was easier to get people in Manchester and London to tell me what they thought <laughs> than it was to get people in Perth. And it is a, a sort of sense that there isn't a sort of combined belief or vision or understanding. And so, for me, it is really important uh, that we help to, to tackle that. And there's lots of silly questions. I mean, I, I added a few in here that I'm sure uh, people will be familiar with. You know, what does it actually... I mean, first of all, what was its name? There's lots of different names. I, I, I'm sure many of you will love the whole principle of uh, the stories that are wrapped up in names. You know, why have we got Blue Blanket Bridge and Gibraltar Key and all of these wonderful... Uh, little clues hidden away in maps that uh, perhaps we need to pay more attention to. Um, you know, is Perth just sort of posh and tweedy or somewhere to drive around, actually, is the, the usual story I, I hear. Um, people say, yes, I know Perth, I drove around it last week. Um, <laughs> it turns out Stirling has a very similar fate. Um, so I think we all just need to stand up a bit more for the places that we live and, and hopefully understand them a bit better. So... Yes, maybe it is a bit posh and tweedy sometimes, but it's also got an amazing history of rebellion and defiance and free thinking. Um, one of my favourite stories was when the provost was made, uh, he was um, given a knighthood when they unveiled the statue to Albert um, on the cuff uh, by Queen Victoria. Uh, and then a month later he got a bill for his knighthood, which apparently at that time was a £1,000, and he sent it back, he sent the bill back and said, and you can keep your knighthood as well, I didn't know. <laughs> um, so there's a real sort of current of rebellion and defiance and free thinking actually, which maybe isn't something people might naturally associate uh, Perth with. with. And also, is it, is it rural or is it peripheral or is it one of the most central cities in Scottish history? You know, what stories should everybody know about? Well, who has heard of the Gary House conspiracy, maybe? Battle of the Clans, probably. Battle of the Old Brig, maybe not. Um, and there are many other stories wrapped up, like, I mean, wonderful ones for me. The, the gentleman who, after Cromwell arrived in the city, thought he could, uh, was blessed by God and could walk on water. Mm -hmm. uh, and he went down to the Tay on a Sunday. Everybody knew, the entire town turned out to watch, uh, as he attempted to walk on water. Didn't go well. Um, uh, and also, you know, the, the history of, I mean, a lot of smuggling in Paris as well, particularly alcohol, uh, which probably led to some of the legitimate alcohol companies later in life. Um, but the wonderful story in County Place of uh, Lucky, uh, and not really, Waterson, who uh, had a pub there and took a delivery of illicit gin, uh, left a candle burning on it when she went to pay the bill, 
and unfortunately you blew the pub up. <laughs> so there are some wonderful stories tucked away in our history, and we talk about rabbit holes, and I thought as part of the development of a future vision for Perth, I really wanted to sort of bring some of those to life, and I thought I could easily write them in a short chronology, because there wasn't that much history in Perth, really. Uh, it currently runs to uh, 750 lines on an Excel spreadsheet, and it's growing all the time. So uh, it's a much more complicated thing than you might think. So my ultimate interest is actually in the future of Perth. What is its sense of place? What is it proud of? What does it want to become? What is it good at that it wants to build on? That desire for a vision and also a sense of sort of taking some ownership of where we want to take the city going forwards. And, but to do that well, it needs, it needs to have integrity. You have to understand what's going on now. So what are its current strengths and weaknesses? What does it think it is? Or what do others think it is? And probably, what isn't it? There's lots of things it probably isn't. And maybe if we're just clearer about that, it might help guide how we might wish to take the, the, the city forwards. Yeah. Perth ultimately is wedded to its landscape and setting. Um, I have picked a Walter Scott quote because he does pop up a lot, of course, but he was uh, unequivocal in his view that Perthshire was the most beautiful part of um, Scotland, in fact, uh, Britain, probably. And why wouldn't it be? It is absolutely stunning, and we should be very, uh, very proud of that. <laughs> Um, so, uh, how the setting, how do we come to the setting? I have um, mercilessly borrowed some of Ken McLean's drawings that he uh, very kindly uh, gave me, and uh, this is one of those. It's, sorry for the slightly squint scan. Um, but of course, this whole area um, formed a long, long time ago. I mean, we're not going to go into Iapetus Suture and all the rest of it, but Highland Boundary Fault Line, lots of uh, lava spilling up. Um, in this area, building sort of Strathmore, um, the bit that you probably know, I'm sure, um, and uh, and we'll come. I'll come back to a little bit of that as well. The sea, the sea is important to Perth again because of the sort of tidal reach, but its accessibility from the sea because that's actually how most people got around, including probably the first hunter gatherers who came to Scotland. So th that was really important. It was actually safer to travel by boat than it was over land in many cases, and therefore. The, the harbour, the reach that Perth has into the sea is really critical. Of course, unfortunately, sometimes that became an invasion point for particularly Romans and others. Um, but a really important part of its setting and its integrity. Uh, and actually, this is, um, this is, I've been playing around in the Ockles recently and just took a couple of pictures. But again, this isn't really particularly far from Perth. This is Ormiston Hill looking towards Dundee and the estuary there. Um, and then you've got wonderful maps too the, to draw on. Um, this is just a small excerpt. But again, Scotland actually shown here connected by a bridge to the rest of Britain. Um, and that's because that, that fourth uh, Clyde uh, barrier and then all the, the bog in between became, made it almost impassable other than pretty much by a sterling. So again, the importance of the, the sort of coastal setting, even though technically Perth isn't really coastal. The hills, I mean, there's another really important point. This is just a slightly adapted map. You've got the Highland uh, Boundary Fault Line, of course, which we all know, uh, which in many ways sort of hid lots of threats, actually, to lowland Scotland. But then you've got the Sidlaws and the Ockles, these two strips of mountains uh, or hills stretching out again to that estuary. Here, again, is a, a picture that many of you will be familiar with. And actually, this is quite a nice picture. You can sort of see... I'm sure you're familiar with the fact that the Sidlaws uh, to the north sort of lean in that way and the Ockles to the south lean in that way to the River Tay. Uh, and so how did that come about? Well, it was an anticline developed, um, the uh, basically pressure of land, um, partly from the um, Iapetus collision, and then that collapsed through fault lines and created a rift valley. And that is an image now. Of what that looks like, if we just expand that very slightly, and there you go. Um, so you can see the Sidlaws, the Ockles, and uh, the area for the Tay in between. You've got Strathmore with the good agricultural <coughs> land. You've actually got the Blegowrie Fault, and then the Schists, and then up into uh, the Highland Boundary Fault Line. Again, this was actually part of the setting in these larval deposits that are now the Ockles and Sidlaws. Again, something I think is really part of the shape 
uh, and character of the place. Then, of course, you've got within that the soil and the rock again, the sort of um, agricultural land around the area. This um, again, just playing around when one of many rabbit holes I've been running down recently. Uh, Cleveland Dykes, of course, a friend of mine uh, inherited a, uh, a drone, uh, so we've been having lots of fun with that. Um, but of course, it was a really important part, uh, area for um, particularly sort of Neolithic hunt and the hunter gatherers initially, and then farming. Uh, and again, just using all of that soil, the siltation that's coming down from the river, etc. So the Perth, you can't really mention Perth and not mention the river. Um, the Tay is such an important feature. There are all sorts of stories tucked away, narratives that actually there's something mystical about the high point of the tide that the Picts understood. I don't know if this is true, but it's certainly something I've heard, which is why the coronation point is where the coronation point is at school. Um, the transport networks are entirely determined by that simple infrastructure around the Sidlaws and the Offals. Um, again, it suddenly explains why all the roads curve round and out of the place. All the, the only exception, really, is the gap at Craig End, um, just between Morden and Mailer Hill, where everything channels through trying to go south. But otherwise, pretty much everything follows those contours. Um, so again, really sort of helps, helps shape um, the, the space and uh, really understand that, uh, that well, how Perth sits. I had a, a friend who said to me once, uh, quite recently actually, that Perth was incredibly flat and a great place to cycle. <laughs> now, if anybody cycles anywhere other than in the immediate <laughs> centre of Perth, it is anything but flat. It's uphill in every direction. And it does sort of sit in a bowl, really, right on the river there. Clearly an important crossing point. Um, there's so many different aspects of that, but again, you can very clearly see just that cleft between uh, Moncrief and Mela there. It's become important as a transport uh, point. And again, that's sort of borne out by some of these slightly <coughs> fuzzy images. I actually prefer that this is a flood map, actually. But again, it really shows up that uh, the features, the mountainous features immediately around Perth. So um, what about the people then? Well, we sort of talked a lot about the Romans, um, who weren't really here for very long, and to be honest, just pretty much committed genocide, according to most people. So I don't know how much there is to celebrate there, but, um, but the Picts um, may or may not have been a people, probably were, sort of, named by the Romans, possibly. It was certainly a southern Pictish kingdom based around Fortrune. There's a lot of belief that that's very much centred in this area. It brings suddenly where Perth was exactly, maybe that doesn't matter, it's the area, but we know that places like Fertivia, Abernethy, Dunkel were really important centres in that space, and uh, I think there's a huge amount of storytelling to be done around that whole Pictish history, um, let alone the Romans, Britons, Scots, the Vikings, there's a great, I mean the new bridge, why it's not called Turner, Turn Again Hill, I don't know, um, it's, that's where it starts, is the, where the, the Battle of Denmark Field uh, took place, um, when a farmer sort of g'd up the local Scots soldiers who were running away uh, and told them all they were a big bunch of wussies and turned round and chased back into the Viking horde with his two sons and they won the day and, uh, and uh, became the, the place got named after them. So again, fantastic little stories, real colour that they bring. Um, and so here again, looking, this is actually looking off the top of Ormiston Hill, uh, looking back towards Perth. And again, you can start to see we talked about the anticline and the way that the valley was actually created. You can sort of see how you can imagine that um, thrust up of land that uh, before the sort of rift valley was formed. And there, stuck in the middle, is Moncrief Hill or Morden. Um, and again, you know, that, just that conjuring and playing out with names. Morden, I'm sure everybody in the room knows, is of course a big hill fort. And lo and behold, it had a big hill fort on it. But interestingly, um, you can also see the ridge line here of the Sidlows, I'm standing, uh, when I took this picture, in, in the sort of uh, eastern Ockles. Again, every single point, every top is picked out beautifully. And it really started to make you realise that you've basically got a sort of natural fortress there with Morden, with lookout posts all the way to the sea. And it is a wonderful, wonderful space. This is looking in the other direction, out towards the coast. Uh, and this is sitting just above Abernethy. And Abernethy, again, maybe somewhere doesn't make enough of itself, and maybe we should make more of it too. I mean, a wonderful place, beautiful, beautiful uh, wee village anyway, but probably where the Christian religion started in Scotland, 
Um, and, uh, and, and Abernethy itself possibly named after Nechton, one of the Pictish uh, rulers. Um, this again looking across from uh, Castle Law uh, above Abernethy, one of the best viewpoints that I could recommend actually. It's a lovely, lovely space and you really get a sense of the whole of the estuary and all the way up to Perth. So, very exciting. This is my own pet theory. You can shoot me down a coffee later. But um, it just, standing there, I was totally taken with that idea of just this series of very visible hill forts and spaces. Uh, nobody could come in by sea and not be noticed before arriving at Morden and Moncrief, which is sat in that cleft between the Iron and the Tide. It's a brilliant, brilliant space. And it's a be beautiful thing, really beautiful thing. I have to say, there is a story of the Romans landing in Tensmuir and um, marching to Perth, and the back of the column like, arrived two hours after the front of the column. Uh, and that must have been right the way down through that, that valley. So uh, quite terrifying, but, uh, but really does sort of bring it home. And I hope, uh, again, as I say, just sort of brings that whole sense of place to life. So, and then, of course, you actually, you know, on Moncrief Hill, this is actually, again, a mate with the drone, uh, looking out again towards the airstream, you can see the arm on the right, the tail on the left there. Um, really lovely sort of aspect, you start to get a real sense of place. So just some nice pictures of that. And of course, the main belief of the, the word Perth is from cops or, you know, small woodland. It's not obvious to people necessarily in the city why that would be the case. Why, why would you talk about trees? It is the heart of Big Tree County, but it doesn't seem obviously to be wooded as such. But it loving well does when you stand a few, a few hundred yards away. Uh, this is the picture. There's Perth nestled in amongst all of that woodland. That was taken two weekends ago. We can tell because it wasn't very good weather. <laughs> so. So for me, the, the really important point about the past is that you can't actually build a vision of the future if you don't understand the place. You've got to have a sense of what it means, what it's meant, where you've come from, in order to move forwards as to what you want it to be, if you want that vision to have integrity. And to me, that's what this is really important, and that's what I hope this map will help to do, is to really define that. The Perth has a, a wonderful history, a rich history, but I don't think yet it really has that sense of place. And yes, okay, there are stories there around the lava, the ice, the rivers, the hills, the trees, the soil, all of that. And of course, of wars and coronations and monarchy and government and parliament. There's a seat of parliament and religion and education and rebellion and smuggling and trade. All of those things, all of those things make up that history. We need to get better at telling the current stories of Perth, of what it is, what it actually feels like. There's so many aspects to it. I think, for me personally, it won't be surprised I'm heavily into sustainability and climate change. I think one of its <coughs> great strengths is the quality of the environment and its sustainability and its potential as a scalable opportunity to demonstrate good practice that bigger cities could learn from and we could actually export globally. And to a degree, we are starting to see some of that. But with the rivers, the big tree country, the north and south inches, canoe, it's a healthy place to live, the connection to the landscape. All of these reasons, farming, food, transport links, connectivity, quality of life, the water of life. Half of Perth is built on whiskey. Um, even insurance, which has an incredible foresight. The renewable sector, SNHs or Nature Scott, this is an old slide, isn't it? Um, all of these things build to that sense of place and the quality of the environment and that connection with landscape, which I think is absolutely critical and very much part of the future. So going forward, what is the vision then that we can take from that? Where do we, how do we make the most of this? How do we build a city that will thrive based on that history, that pedigree, that integrity? That really is the question. And I think I wanted to end... Um, in tribute partly um, to Patrick Geddes, maybe a bit to Kenny as well. I think Patrick Geddes also spoke for the PSNS, was he not? Also honoured by the PSNS as well. So, um, but John Ruskin also. John Ruskin used to um, come on a holiday to Perth. He was a regular visitor in the summer. Friends with Wordsworth. The two of them uh, used to bemoan the fact that when trains were invented, 
people would travel too fast through the countryside to appreciate it. So I'm not sure what they'd make of that aircraft, but never mind. Um, and nature is painting for us day after day pictures of infinite beauty, if only we have the eyes to see them. John Ruskin, obviously very uh, significant um, sort of philosophical figure really in his day. And Geddes, of course, a polymath, incredible man, involved in so many different things. He was also involved in RSGS, so a lovely connection with PSMS again. And, uh, and I know this was one of Kenny's favourite quotes. Some people have strange ideas that they live by money. They think energy is generated by the circulation of coins, whereas the world is mainly a vast leaf colony, growing and forming a leafy soil, not a mere mineral mass. We live not by the jingling of our coins, but by the fullness of our harvests. Good morning everyone and good to see you all. Obviously we are here to launch an historical map of Paris and Paris is particularly suitable to be mapped. First because we know so much about it. We have lots of things to put on our map. Second because Paris more than most Scottish boroughs I think has a particularly compact and intelligible form. Once you get your eye in, it all makes sense, and maps are a particularly good way of understanding it. As we've already seen this morning uh, with, with Mike, Perth is what it is because of where it is, at the crossing of the Tay and the limits of navigation in sight of the Highland Boundary Fault, which you can see in the distance there. The country of the wild Scots, as to quote John Shirley, as you go north, and as we see, bounded by the Tay, the, that's the historic core of Perth, bounded by the Tay, and by the North Inch and the South Inch, and then ground rising, there's the Pomerian Flats, away to the west. So a very compact <coughs> and well-defined space uh, forms the, the centre of the, of, of the historic borough. And as we have mentioned already, it's, in historic times, the lowest crossing point of the Tay, uh, represented there by uh, John Smeaton's bridge of the early 1770s. But that's not really the, um, the earliest crossing point. That's an old slide. I mean, that started life as a chemical film slide back in the days of wind-on cameras. But if you look closely, you'll see Smeaton's bridge, and at low water, you might see that, that sort of shadow mm -hmm. in the surface of the water. And that, I would like to believe, and I sort of do believe, is the, the turbulence caused by the remains of Perth's medieval bridges still surviving underwater and sort of creating turbulence at low water. So that's the lowest crossing point. But if we go back to about 1027, um, to to where, what Perth might have been a hundred years before it became a borough. And so we have here a road leading down to the high street there. We have the crossing point of the river, probably a low, mostly timber bridge, slightly offset from the end of the high street. We have boats in the, in the river um, coming up uh, from the North Sea, and that's important, as we've already heard, Perth being the limit of, of navigation up the Tay. We've got the, the parish church of St John the Baptist sitting there, and we've got along here the beginnings of Watergate as a dry ridge of natural ground. And that precinct around St John's Kirk, I'll say a wee bit more about that in a minute, and St John's Kirk in the middle of it all on high ground, and then all round about we have the ground sloping away into a sort of waterlogged marsh. And what's going to... So that's what gives us this very compact kind of form naturally protected and naturally restricted 
and it's going to give us a very strong incentive to keep on raising the ground level as successive buildings are replaced. I often try to explain to people um, that Perth is in many ways not unlike a compact. It's a sort of very compact mass of black squashy material. We'll see more of that in a minute with a crust on top. Um, tightly combined. Visit Scotland have never really adopted this as a, 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 a strategy. I, I can't understand why I think they're missing something there. Um, but there you are. And, you know, and that, that, in a way, is what makes Perth so intrinsically mappable and what makes maps a good way to understand it. That's the part of the enclosure ditch um, around uh, St John's Kirk, um, radiocarbon dated to the early um, thousands AD. So that's given, taking you 100 years before the borough of the 1120s. That's, um, that's 80 to 86 High Street, which was HSBC and is now Bakington for sale, which is um, a sad, uh, another, another part of, of, of our sort of problem of, 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 of the centre of Paris, like many places, being um, some, somewhat sort of overtaken by events at the moment. As we all know, the Tay is prone to flooding after a winter thaw, and that's an extreme flood level projected onto the contours of modern Paris, revealing the, the outlines of the early 11th century settlement. That's sort of what makes Paris what it is. That's an artefact. That's, that's the, the ramp going up to Smeaton's Bridge in the 1770s. So if we ignore that, the rest is real, showing how the, the, the core of medieval Perth around St John's Kirk and the High Street and Watergate is the bit that doesn't get wet when the water comes in. But that, again, defines how Perth is going to develop and... Um, why it, why it has the shape it is. With Watergate as a, a natural ridge of uh, dry ground. Whereas the high street is never really perfectly dry. That's 80 to 86 high street being excavated directly opposite Marks and Spencer's as you'll see. Um, and you can see below basement level, the deep black layers of waterlogged midden. And there was much, much more of that um, on, the side, on the other side of the road, Marks and Spencer, which uh, my, my colleague David Perry uh, knew extremely well. I can tell you all about if you if you uh, fasten on to him later. <coughs> and so that's, that's what gives Perth its archaeological character. All that wet, black, sticky material um, which preserves wood and leather and um, animal bone and all sorts of organic materials that wouldn't survive elsewhere. That's what has, has filled the new museum with such interesting things. But it's also what gives Perth its particular character as low-lying, prone to flooding and rather compact. The conditions preserve things like um, animal products, and, that's a, and that is a, a, a reminder of just how, um, how busy the centre of Perth would have been in medieval times, with all sorts of processes being done in the open air, like butchery, that we, we don't see so much of now, and perhaps forget even happen. Um, and the, uh, the, the degree to which uh, Perth preserves the remains of animal bones, of skins and hides, and all those things that go with the production of, uh, of food. And, of course, it even preserves the smell as well. Um, the the waterlogged midden has a most distinctive aroma for those of us who, who spend time in it. Um, and that's part of, part of the interest. The preservation of organic materials is what has made Perth so um, interesting from an archaeological point of view. Around St John's Kirk, also, the, the ground level has risen. You can see, uh, if you look closely at the, the west door, you can see how the, the, um, the arch of the west door is rather strangely proportioned, because quite a lot of it is actually underground. That's not because of the build-up of Midden, 
Uh, St. John's is unnaturally high ground. But what's caused the, what's caused the build-up around St. John's Kirk mm -hmm. is the fact that until the, the, um, the Reformation, the, the town's main cemetery was around St. John's Kirk. And so the, the congregation under the pavement rather outnumbered the usual Sunday congregation <laughs> and have, um, have built up the ground level, which is why when you go into St. John's Kirk, you go downstairs, um, because the, the ground's risen around it. That happens in a number of, of very old Scottish churches as well. Um, the old parish church in Dunedin, just outside uh, St. Andrews, was replaced in the 19th century in part because it was by then semi-subterranean and that made it even darker and damper and more miserable than it would otherwise have been, which is why it was uh, replaced by a much later building. And that's a recurring theme in some of the older parish churches of Scotland. Our old friend, um, Rutherford 1774, which is um, well known as a, as a one of the one of the earliest actual surveyed maps as opposed to a sketch plan. And it shows most of the major features of the medieval and early modern town. You can see um, you've got the main streets, the high street and south street. You've got the line of the town defences. You've got the toll booth across the end of the high street with the harbour there. Another harbour here at the end of the... Um, the canal, which is the, the lane coming down to the city mills, dividing and then forming a defensive um, <coughs> circuit around Paris. But as, as we've already seen, that's not really a defensive ditch dug from scratch. It seems to be what, the, what they are doing is improving and tidying up an already existing area of low-lying ground. It's the, the margins of that uh, platform on which Perth first develops, being regularised and straightened and formalised to give us the defensive circuit that you see in Rutherford. And because the, because the, um, the, 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 the property boundaries and the street plan survived so well, you can look at Rutherford and work out more or less what the medieval town plan was as well. And many, many years ago, a colleague of ours, um, Mike Spearman, did that, had a look at the maps, and worked out a sort of sequence of how Perth would have developed, starting at the densely populated end nearest the river. This is the east end, by the way, that for some reason a lot of the early plans of Perth have north to the right rather than at the top, and then gradually expanding outwards to what becomes a rather more sparsely populated area um, at the western end of the defensive circuit. And he worked out a sequence something like that, um, which we later modified slightly on the basis of, of later archaeology, but basically following that concept of the, of the town expanding progressively and being understandable by looking at its maps. And lots of, of the features that are important in understanding the, the town plan of Perth, if they don't survive, they're at least marked or they're findable, like the market cross at the intersection of High Street and Skinner Gate, um, like the toll booth across the end of the High Street, now gone, but the foundations are still underground, and we've seen them from time to time when, um, uh, when there have been things like uh, drainage works and, and, and other services going on in, in, in that area. That's um, a slightly earlier more of a sketch plan. Um, that, that's uh, painted 1715, sketched mostly to show the, um, the Jacobite defences around Perth at the time of the First Rising, but also showing incidentally that the, uh, the density of, of <coughs> early modern Perth wasn't all that great. You have, Obviously the, the garden design, is, 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 there's an element of whimsy in that, but it's probably accurate in saying that a lot of the backlands of Perth were, were garden ground at that period, and that it wasn't as densely populated as it later became. It did become densely populated. That's the building where Sainsbury's now is, and that's one of the older buildings surviving visible above ground in the High Street. And what's quite interesting there is that if, 
it used to have a basement. Yeah, that's the, the basement's been infilled now in St. Hubert's, and that's a common pattern that no one really wants to use basements in the centre of Perth because they're damp, they're dark, and not easily accessible. And certainly for shops, they, you couldn't make them suitable for the public. But if we have a look under that building, you'll see there the, um, the party walls in the basement between one property and the next, and the extreme complexity of the of the the masonry in that in that bit of wall, you lots and you could spend a long time looking at that, at that wall, trying to work out which bits came first, and that's a characteristic of Perth. You could look at the, the divisions between one property and the next as they appear on Rutherford. They've been around for hundreds of years, and that means the party walls have been around for hundreds of years as well and tend to survive even when the building above gets replaced. The other thing that you notice is that as you move into the, um, the 18th and 19th centuries, Paris' population density begins to build up, so basements start to be inhabited. You get fireplaces in basements. There were fireplaces in that particular basement. And things like attics tend to get used as well. So you get fireplaces in attics. Um, that, I don't know how that's got rotated. They didn't put it up the right. But notice the house to let sign, a very, very old house to let sign in the, beside that fireplace that obviously been put up um, and, and on display perhaps a hundred years ago or more when people were living in the, the attic of that building that's now above Sainsbury's. Sainsbury's, incidentally, the basement's not used anymore. It's been backfilled. And all the upper, I think the first floor, I think, might be used for storage. And then all the upper floors are vacant. They're just empty space. Um, and you couldn't easily make them habitable now. They, they just wouldn't you know, meet with, with uh, modern sort of standards of, of comfort and convenience. The attic still has some most interesting graffiti um, of when it was inhabited in the 20th century. And the drawing of the, of the bearded police officer wearing only his helmet tells a story which I don't understand at all. <laughs> the, things like the town defensive circuit are very clearly visible on uh, Rutherford and on Pettit, as you see there, following the line of the lade. And as we all know, there's a bit of that defensive circuit still surviving in Albert Close. At the, at the end of Mill Street, just across the road from what used to be Perth Museum and Art Gallery, and is now Perth Art Gallery, showing, ignore the, uh, the trolley, which is a, another feature of urban life, but showing you Perth's laid, uh, acting as a defensive moat outside what alleges to be the, uh, the last surviving <coughs> fragment of Perth City Wall, which it might well, that's the... Uh, that's the bit of the wall there. Ignore the, the special historic and heritage really bins as well. But that's how that was about 30 years ago uh, when we, we excavated it. And there's the, the bit of the city wall. And they're much, much lower down on the foundations of a much older wall. Which suggests that there probably really was a defensive circuit running along there. So again, the sort of thing that you can see on a map that you can see on the ground and it all makes sense. Rutherford also shows you quite a lot of the, of the major street plan. The High Street with its very distinctive curve and South Street, always less important because until modern times it just comes to a stop at the Gallery House. So it's a road that doesn't go anywhere. Whereas the High Street used to lead to a bridge but by this time the, um, the bridge has been moved but the high street is, is always the more important thoroughfare. The curve you'll notice, and on this uh, reconstruction drawing, courtesy of the Heritage Trust, the curve's much more prominent, and the high street has that very distinctive banana shape, um, curved, but uh, much, much wider in the middle. And that's real, because the high street was about two metres wider on either side, and was gradually straightened up and contracted as people encroached on the high street over time. So when you look at uh, some of the excavations, this is 8286 High Street again, you find that the old footpath, the old pavement, this gravel area here, is now inside the property because the, 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 the street frontage has, has been moved forward as um, pro private properties have encroached. 
And if you look at Rutherford, again, that makes sense. You can see here where, as it were, the banana is being straightened. As the old song has it, I've never seen a straight banana. But this is an attempt to create one by pushing forwards and cutting into the, uh, the width of the high street. And across the road at what used to be the Ab Abbey National and is now Santander, you can actually see this plank sitting on the road surface. That's the remains of a temporary stall that was laid out about 500 years ago and never taken, never taken down. That was a common problem which popped up in the, the council records from time to time, ordering people to remove their middens from the street, ordering people to remove their stalls from the street, to remove their stairways from the street and so on. Because constantly people are squeezing forwards into the, the public space and stealing a little bit of it for themselves. Um, and you can actually see the process going on right there. I think it's also because there's this movement where what was um, the business that was transacted out in the open air gradually moves indoors. Charles McKean was a great believer in the, um, the idea of the wind-protected city and the concept that medieval towns, especially Paris and Dundee, you could see how open public spaces and streets and so on were designed to be quite spacious for circulation, but closed off at the end so as to reduce the effects of wind, so that people could conduct their business out of doors. And as that changes, the, um, the, the, the usefulness of that outdoor space also reduces. And you can... So you can see the, and be reminded of the, uh, the banana gradually getting straightened there. This uh, reconstruction drawing, of course, um, shows Paris on the eve of the Reformation, 1559, uh, and the clouds of smoke are arising from the various religious houses surrounding Paris, and, uh, and we were exceptionally well provided with them. Um, and as I begin to come towards the, the end of my little rapid review of um, a thousand years of Paris history, one, we know quite a lot about some of them. Well, we know where Greyfriars is, and we're not going to excavate there for obvious reasons, because it's a burial ground. Um, we sort of know where Blackfriars is, and we did excavate there a long, long time ago, um, and found little bits of it. There's, um, the, there's White Friars, which Derek knows enormously well, um, up in this area here, slightly be, beyond view. And all, it always, sadly, always, White Friars always gets sort of pushed to the edge. It shouldn't, but it does. It just, it, it's the bit that doesn't fit on the map. Um, <laughs> this one here is interesting. That is, of course, the, the Charter House, the Carthusians. And that's a monastery, not a friary. And in its day, would have been the most important and prestigious of them all as being the National Mausoleum that James I created for himself and his dynasty. He always wanted to be buried there, and he is, but just not quite a bit sooner than he expected, <laughs> <laughs> on account of his being murdered in Paris. Um, we all know the, 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 uh, the King James VI hospital, which is part of that uh, property, but the, the original charter house was enormously bigger than just the King James VI <laughs> Hospital and was arranged in a very unusual way. Um, I, I sometimes call the uh, charter houses, Carthusian uh, monasteries, were arranged in, in what I sometimes call a holy motel, that, that each monk had his own little cell and his own little garden arranged around the cloister. Um, and they were sort of self catering. Um, uh, and that continued well up into the 20th century as a, as, as a, as a Carthusian tradition. They, they, they gave it up eventually because one, one particular um, Carthusian said, we found that too many of the brothers were spending all day thinking of the perfect way to cook a potato. <laughs> <laughs> but um, the reason I mention it was it's, it's, it's so much of it is now invisible and it is so important. Um, you can see when you look at this 1920s map of Perth, there's um, Canal Crescent there's a <coughs> there, and there's Hospital Street, there's the King James VI Hospital. Mm -hmm. And the curious alignments of all the roads in this area are to do with the fact that 
the, they, they have been affected by the layout of the, of the Charter House. It's still there. King James I is still there. So is Margaret Tudor, uh, Henry VIII's big sister. So is Joan Beaufort, um, the, uh, the consort of James I. They're all underground in there somewhere. Um, and it's an example to, sort of, as it were, to more or less conclude with that although we have a map of Paris, it's not finished yet. There's lots we, st we know a lot, but there's lots we still don't know. Um, there's lots to come back to, and various people have interesting ideas of what might be possible on that site of the, of the Carthusians, which we're, we're all looking forward to. So, to, to close with, um, a happy thought from um, Grey Friars, life how short, <laughs> and eternity how long. <laughs> and on that thought, I will stop. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Um, yes, I'm John Moore. I am the... Um, to, to carry on Teresa's analogy about classic cars. I'm the car dealer who came to try and sell the idea to PSNS. And um, it's my fortunate position to be able to thank you for taking up the challenge and carrying it on. Um, I trained as a geographer and uh, worked at Glasgow University for 40 years. And um, I'm passionately, um, insufferably enthusiastic about maps and history. And to carry on Teresa's um, other analogy, May is a very important month for Perth because not only does it celebrate this year the 600th anniversary of the coronation of James I, but today, is the 465th anniversary of the sermon that John Knox preached in St John's Kirk to establish the Reformation, which, if nothing else, destroyed an awful lot of <laughs> Perth's um, history. For those whose history stretches towards more recent times, of course, May, three years ago, was the month in which the Saints won the Scottish Cup. <laughs> And since I was born in Easter Road and lived in cheering distance of Easter Road, I was there at Hampden to see St. Johnson win against the, my home team. Anyway, that's history. It's my good fortune to be able to wrap all this up and to thank everybody for attending, to thank PSNS for hosting today, but more importantly, to thank our funders, because... Anybody who uh, is interested at all in local history or the whole um, dealing with the past knows that we live in difficult times for such things. Societies find it struggling to get members. Um, history seems somewhat tiresome for some people. It's not as enthusiastic. Um, there are people who are still going there, but if you look at, for example, the Scottish Local History Forum, it does struggle to give the support that maybe is needed for a whole range of interest groups. So we must thank the funders very much. And as you can see their name there, um, and because I'm getting old and senile, I'll have to read them in more detail. Perth and Crinneros' Heritage Trust, the Guildry Incorporation of Perth, Thompson Charitable Trust, and Perth Civic Trust. These are all people who put their hands in their pocket for us. As I said, nothing can be done without um, financing it. But to me, more importantly, is the um, support in kind that we've also had from a whole range of people. Um, and particularly the Royal Scottish Geographical Society. Um, I am so old that I can remember um, D.G. Moyer coming to the library in Glasgow when he was working on the early maps of Scotland, third edition. Um, Mr. Moyer was, um, seemed an old man then, but since I'm probably older than he was when he came here now, I've got to choose my words carefully. Moyer, Moyer to me, encapsulated what was great about the um, RSGS 
He had an interest in the totality of Scotland. Um, he was interested in uh, rights of way society and being a Monroeist, I um, have always appreciated the work that they did. But he had this passion for learning and that, that to me is so much part of what we try to do. We tr create things, but they're no use if they just sit on the shelf. You have to take them off the shelf, you have to use them. So thank you very much. Thank you also to Culture Perth and Can Ross, because they are the people who give the tools to make things with. Archives, uh, museums, uh, local history uh, groups, these are the people who are there to say, why don't you look at this? Why don't you look at that? So, without going on too much detail, thank you very much. Um, I hope that you will look at the exhibition on making the map. I hope that you will possibly even think about buying a copy of the map. And also, talking again about what um, has been said already about future vision, you will give a great deal of thought to the potential of a Historic Towns Trust Atlas of Perth. There's certainly plenty there for it, and I wish you well in that. Thank you very much.